Second set of examples has to do with redistribution. As I said, something that's more controversial. This involves the transfer of natural assets to low-income individuals and communities. And again, I want to give you uh, three examples. The first has to do, and really the, this is the biggest example in, uh, in world history, I believe, has to do with land reform, particularly in Asia, particularly East Asia, after uh, World War II, in the middle of the 20th century. Up until that time, the land relations in countries like China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, were uh, characterized by very poor tenant farmers who did all the work, grew the crops, and at the end of the season had to turn over a very large share of their harvest to landlords who basically, as people used to say where I lived in Bangladesh, where they had a similar system, they defined a landlord as someone who sits and sitting eats. It was their idea of basically you know, a lazy bum who doesn't do any work and gets all the food. And that, that's not far from the truth. That's what it was like in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan as well. But after World War II, there was a profound redistribution of land in all of these countries. Land being in these predominantly agricultural societies of the time, the most important, the single most important natural asset, the most important form of the wealth of nature. And it happened under very different circumstances in all of these places. So in Japan, some of you will recognize this gentleman, General Douglas MacArthur, who was the commander of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces during the occupation of Japan after uh, World War II. It was the U.S. military occupation that decreed the land reform in Japan, a land of the tiller reform, with the basic motive being political, actually. The U.S. analysis was that the land and oligarchy of Japan, the landlord class, had been a backbone of Japanese militarism and a way to make sure that we didn't face that threat again would be to democratize the distribution of land, make it into a nation of small farmers, and then we'd be less likely to face that sort of threat. That's how it happened in Japan. It worked pretty well in Japan. In China, this was the guy who engineered it, Mao Zedong, leader of the Chinese Communist Party. That was a land reform led by uh, revolutionary uh, communists. It also redistributed land to the tiller, experimented with various different forms of organization of agriculture, including some rather ill-fated attempts at collectivization in the 60s, and ultimately uh, led to the agrarian structure we have in China today, which, although it has imperfections, uh, is a lot more egalitarian than the one that existed uh, before the revolution uh, in the uh, pre-World War II period. Similarly, in South Korea, we got a land reform. In Taiwan, we got a land reform. Again, different political circumstances in each place. I would suggest to you that this not only raised the living standards of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Asian farmers, which it did, and did very quickly, because now they could grow the food and eat it themselves instead of turning it over to the landlords, but it also helped to lay the foundation for the rapid economic growth, which has been the most uh, remarkable feature of economic history uh, in East Asia in the last uh, 50 years. It, by democratizing the distribution of land, the most important asset, it created societies where people were able to send their kids to school, invest in that so-called human capital, and where you had uh, an ability on the part of the population to participate in the economic growth process. That's an example of redistribution of natural assets, and it's happened on a massive scale. To briefly mention two other examples, uh, some of you may recognize this man, Chico Mendez. He was the leader of the rubber tappers in Amazonia and campaigned in the 1980s against deforestation of the Amazon, particularly by cattle ranchers, which was destroying his livelihood and that of his, his, uh, his fellow rubber tappers. And uh, what he campaigned for was the creation of something called extractive reserves, where land would be protected from uh, deforestation, and the rubber tappers and other indigenous peoples who engaged in traditional extractive activities would be permitted to keep engaging in those activities. They could still keep tapping the trees and taking out rubber, or taking out Brazil nuts, or other forest products. They just wouldn't be deforesting the land, which they weren't the ones doing it anyway, right? So this is a rather different model of conservation from the traditional model, which was just build a fence around it and keep everybody out. This is keep people in and have them help protect the land. 
Chico Mendez gave up his life for that struggle. He was murdered by a cattle rancher in 1989, and the first extractive reserve in, in Brazil was named after him. Now there are, I believe, something like a dozen of them across the country, and they're actually quite effective at uh, stopping deforestation. That's a form of redistribution. It redistributed that land into the hands of the rubber tappers, who previously had no land rights. A final example involves mineral resources. This woman's in Bolivia. She's looking down on one of the big mines in Bolivia, I'm sorry, Peru. And um, in the case of mineral extraction, very often local communities get none of the benefit, none of the income flows. Uh, I'm not talking here about the copper country, but you can fill in the blanks if you know the history here. But what they do get is a lot of the damages, a lot of the damaged landscapes, a lot of the runoff and the pollution, uh, the poisoned water supplies, etc. And there are many efforts around the world, including in Peru, to change that and to give local communities rights over those resources so that they can, if they want to see those resources develop, they can get some benefit from it. And if they want to protect those resources and protect their environment, they can uh, do that as well.